Today we're going to tear down this Yamaha MT120. I'm not doing any specific electronic or mechanical repairs on this. I haven't really tested it yet. It's more if you've got one of these and you want to clean it, you want to change belts or whatever, but you're, you want a little bit of reconnaissance about how to deconstruct it, then here's your video. <laughs> Later on we're going to be cleaning the mixer, so let's get all the knobs off from the front that we can. These faders come off from the front. I'm just prying them up using some sort of plastic tool so I don't scratch the case too much. I've got four white ones, one red one here. Bear in mind that if you were only going to change the belt on this then cleaning the mixer wouldn't strictly be necessary though I would tend to do that as a matter of course with any sort of neglected multi-tracker. These large dials also come up again, four white ones and a red one, well they're all black aren't they, but the, the colour of the stripe I mean. Make sure that you've got a soft surface that you're turning this down onto, make sure that you're not getting any scratches on that far side. The two halves of the plastic case attached from the rear, there's two types of screw, I've gone ahead and removed those. So these places where you can see I've marked with white tape, so one, two, three, four, five, six. In those locations we've got screws like this, so maybe three centimetres wide ferrule going along most of their length. And then in these two locations we've got a longer screw and a smooth shank covering most of it and then a shorter part with again a wide ferrule. And then you're going to want to fold it, tip it back like that. Something you're going to notice about mine is that I've actually replaced um, some of these headers with the JST XH connectors. Some of these multi trackers, oh, let me get out this out of the bag to show you, they come with headers a bit like this where there's like a little spring loaded clip in there. So you take a cl plastic clip off and uh, then you would push individually on these pins with a flathead screwdriver to get the exposed metal ends of the ribbon cable out of the socket. The thing is if you do that for me it's almost invariably been really difficult to get the ribbon cables back in there. So I've crimped on these connectors so I can easily disconnect and reconnect and disconnect this as much as I need to. If you're not intending to go all the work of soldering in the header here and crimping on the connector here, though then you're going to need to negotiate this with these cables still attached. And you can see that this one's short enough that it's actually going to put some strain on there. Um, so maybe you need to have something back here to lean this against. It's an aspect of the design of this I'm not particularly happy with. Um, it's something we'll come to in a minute as well. Is there's this big ribbon cable that comes from the transport and it's soldered in at this end. It originally had this uh, very unusual, it's maybe not that unusual, but I haven't seen one before, double-ended header here. You know, I, I just couldn't get this transport reconnected once I took the wire out. Because I couldn't find a replacement header, you can see that I split the ribbon cable and I've just soldered it into the board. So for the purposes of this video I'm not going to be detaching this transport from the rest of the assembly completely. I'm going to have it hanging off to the side and I suggest you do the same with this cable still connected because that can be very difficult to detach. Just for my convenience, the amount of space I've got here where the camera's placed, I am going to detach these cables just now. But be aware you've probably got a different kind of connector there that's not going to be as easy to put back in as these. Let's get this transport out of the case as much as we can. We're going to detach the cables running from the magnetic heads to the record playback board which is this one here. We don't want to use the strength of the wires to pull these out. Some of these wires are very thin and delicate so just coax those out using a pair of pliers. White plug goes into white socket and red plug goes into red socket. Two halves of the recording playback head and this one's the erase head here. So if you want to detach that for tape looping purposes and here's your plug. So we can get this transport away from its mounting posts. Um, one, two, three, four screws. You can see that this lower right one, there's a common ground ring connector. It's running along to this shuttle control board here. 
black screw, wide ferrule all along its length, maybe a centimetre and a half in length. And then the top left corner, we've got a common ground connector as well. Two, in fact, top most of which is running to this board here with the power switch and the main filter capacitors on it. And uh, the other common ground ring connector on that corner is running to the motor itself. I'll just get these other two screws out. So from this point forward, the screws that I'm removing are of the same type unless I say otherwise. Counter is mounted onto the transport, so we'll need to detach it. If you're on this board here, you can see that that ribbon cable is soldered in there, and unless you remove it from the original connector, which I don't recommend, it's going to be detached at this end. So you're going to have this much leeway to move this around. What I'll do is I'll push that over to the side, and we can have a look at this over here. Right, let's have a bit of a closer look at the transport in the MT120. So we've got a single motor here um, because of this black covering. I can't see exactly what the model is, but it's likely to be the same motor that we have an equivalent speed of multi-trackers from Tascam. Uh, we can see that there's a, a double pulley here, one of which is going via flat belt to the flywheel, so that will be turning the cab stand. And then this one is going to a wheel here, which will be turning the reel mechanism. Transport 101, transport's doing three things. One is raising and lowering these magnetic heads in this pinch roller. When the pinch roller gets the tape between there and the cap stand, then the rotation of the cap stand draws the tape across the heads at a steady speed in playback and record modes. So this going up and down is function one, this is function two, the turning of the cap stand. Function three is a mechanism that allows for the turning of the take-up reel and the supply reel um, in playback and fast-forward mode. This needs to turn that way anti-clockwise and in rewind mode that needs to turn anti-clockwise. We'll have a look once we get this plate off. It looks like we need to take this plate off in order to be able to change the upper of those two belts. But I suspect that there's some sort of teeth or something at the base of this flywheel on the other side of that capstan when we press the shuttle buttons on the unit that will be setting off solenoids you can see there's at least one solenoid there i suspect there's another one under there and those uh, will be like moving shift arms so you know think of like the bits that hang off the sides of um, a, a set of gears on a bike and make them change gear so the solenoids will be doing that and that will be changing whether these cams and gears catch the lower part of this turning flywheel. I think I spotted a, a little leaf switch in here, but um, at certain positions they'll close and um, that will give feedback to the logic system. That's how it changes modes. For the purposes of repair, we don't need to intimately understand how all this stuff works. It's more a matter of, is it clean? Is it lubricated? Are all the teeth there? Are all the springs there? Are all the clips present? Has someone else been in there and lost a part? Can we find a replacement part? That kind of thing. And sort of like the same way if you're like a, a fitter in a shop that sells tires and exhausts, you can definitely identify a, a fucked exhaust and change it without having the same understanding of the cars that personally designed it. So I'm trying to get this plate off so we can get a clearer look at the mechanism and um, this is a necessary step for changing this belt here. And we've got another little screw here. And this third one on the front here as well. So let's quickly look at those screws. Um, they're smaller. You can see I'm using a smaller crosshead screwdriver. Two short ones and a long one. The long one's um, going through the front of that plate into that post there. So that would allow you to take off that belt. I think this one you could probably just take off anyway. Do we need to? It's going to be difficult for me to do while I'm filming. I think we probably can get a replacement belt back onto here without actually removing this little printed circuit board. We could probably use tweezers or something to help guide it around there. If it got too fiddly, then it looks like this attaches by two little screws where my fingers are. That would make it easier to replace that if you're struggling. I'm just wary before I take this flywheel off. You see, some, sometimes there'll be a 
and there, and there is here. There's a little plastic washer there, and that's to stop any dirt getting into the recess where the capstan passes through the chassis. So if I pull that out, yeah, um, so you can see that there is, um, I mean, that comes off and slots into two little recesses in the metal by the looks of it, but there's plastic teeth and that's going to be interacting with this series of gears and so on on here um, to raise and lower the heads. I won't deconstruct this anymore in this video. I'm going to assume that this is all nicely lubricated and um, it's just this belt that needs changed. You can see it's a bit dry and crispy, very definite curves where it sat for a while. Yeah, it doesn't really have much stretch in it. And you're going to want to replace that, so I'll measure that in a minute to give you a rough idea of what size you would require. Yeah, there should be a, um, a belt um, running from a little pulley belt into the take-up reel to this mechanical counter, so that's missing. I'll find an appropriate size belt for that as well. And here's the belt sizes, the capstan belt, um, that's the flat one, um, that was 145 millimetres in folded length. The real belt, which sat below it, uh, I don't know why I can't draw the character E, um, but that was 100 millimetres in folded length, that was square in section, about a um, millimetre in cross section, quite a, a chubby one, quite chunky. Uh, the counter belt, that was uh, about 60, not metres, millimetres, I missed out on M. 60 millimetres in folded length, that's square in section, that's probably about half a millimetre to a millimetre in width and uh, that one I got from um, one of these multi-packs you get where you get a couple hundred belts for a few pounds you get those on eBay, AliExpress, that kind of thing but these two I would probably invest in a good manufacturer of neoprene belts if I could Moving on to getting the printed circuit boards away from the plastic case down here. You know, I'm imagining we needed to solder some of these parts or for some reason to do with, you know, signal tracing or something, you needed to have this board out from its case. So we'll take off this little daughter board here that's got socket for external control. We've got our shuttle buttons and record and playback indicator LEDs on it. There's one screw here. We're back to these sort of centimetre and a half long wide ferrule screws. There's the second one. Um, that's going to then dangle through this collection of wires here and soldered in at both ends. But that's not particularly inconvenient to have a small board like that dangling. Wires going to the transformer here, kind of passing through a little. What do we call that? Well, there's a little cutout on that board there to keep them tidy anyway. Got to be very strong cable so we can, I think, just pull those out. It's actually very stiff. Let me get a pair of pliers. There we go. I mean, if you wanted to take that transformer out completely, you can see that there are two very heavy duty looking screws there holding it in place. Um, for the purposes of this demonstration, I will leave that transformer just sitting there. Got this little power conditioning board. Well, I assume that's what it is. We've got four diodes there, so that's probably a rectifier. These two largest capacitor or almost certainly the uh, filter capacitors are turning the rectified in signal into somewhat flat and smooth DC signal. If you don't know what a rectifier is or filter capacitors are, it's beyond the scope of this video really. Just type those search terms into YouTube or Google, you'll get loads of information. I know from experience that there is some kind of transistor involved with the power that's down on a heat sink under here. It's going to a cable here that we can pull out and then this little board is held onto the chassis with two screws. That's then just going to dangle off the side via this ribbon cable which is soldered in at both ends. Um, we've got one, two, three, four, five screws attaching this large printed circuit board to the bottom half of the case. Something that's really nice about this design is that it's very, very well labelled what everything does. There's sections showing right this is all to do with record level, it says which track is which, even some of the exposed wires decode out, encode out, it's labelled to, to show you which 
which wires are carrying which signals and because it's a whiteboard with black text it's very high contrast I mean even the the pinouts for the different um, headers are labeled on the board so that's very nice from the point of view of someone trying to troubleshoot something like this just before I take it out as well I'll just point out the trim pots so this is a dual speed unit it's got 4.8 centimeters per second or 9.5 centimeters per second is your high and low speed you're gonna find that 4.8 centimeters is the same as one and seven eighth inches and that 9.5 centimeters is the same as three and three quarter inches um, since those are the two speeds that Tascam uses that's how you calibrate your the speed of the motor on the transport you do that by getting a known pitch on tape say you've got a tape and you know that there's an organ note it should be 440 Hertz then you turn this with the uh, pitch control on dead center until your frequency counter that's hooked up to your tape output reads pretty close to 440 hertz at that point your speed is calibrated you can see that we can also set record level it's actually very well laid out here so if you've got one of these just look right in beside these little white trim pots uh, the ones you'd be concerned with if you had like one track that was way quieter or you're getting recordings that were playing back much more quietly than you thought they were going to when you were recording them and it's record amplifier level and playback level that you want to adjust you have to do a playback level first and then the record level um, I've got lots of videos about calibration on the channel go and watch one of the detailed ones from my channel homepage and apply what you see to this model if that's something you need to do anyway we'll get these screws out and I'll just show you this little board under here three screws mounting oh sorry I said it was a transistor I've forgotten that's a pair of capacitors further filtering I assume uh, but you know, if you needed to replace those test them whatever that's, that's where they sit by the way, that white stuff there, that's not leaking electrolytic fluid. If you're wondering what that would look like, that's just glue so that these don't rattle about. If you look at these side on, they're very flat, so it's unlikely to me that those need replacing. If this glue is very discolored, that might suggest that some of the fluids had got out. If these were bulging, that might suggest it, but they look healthy enough to me. You can see we've got this shielding underneath, but it's mostly held down with double-sided tape. I wouldn't bother to remove that unless absolutely necessary for some reason that I can't think of. Um, you could put it down with double sided carpet tape if that became something you needed to do. And let's get these um, upper PCBs separate from the case. I'll start with this one on the left. Looks like this screw here is a hole coming through from the other half. Sorry, I'm pointing it in this bottom left corner. And one of the things you want to do before you take any of these out, you can see that on this board, I put a cross through some of these holes. The point is that the screw's meant to come through from the other part of the case and into those holes. So we want to distinguish between those kind of holes where we're expecting a screw from the other half of the case and those where we're applying a screw directly onto the PCB. That was meant to be a, a case one there, but we would have a screw there. I've still got one in here. Um, here I've written E to point at this one because you can see we've got a little ring connector to common ground. These are just hints to yourself when you reconstruct this about how to put it back together. And um, you can see I've kind of written on it where that earth ring should go so it's to the shield for the graphic EQ. You can see there's shield for the graphic EQ there. This little collection of wires here is soldered at both ends. And you see there's that little um, design so the lip of this PCB is going to sit on top of this one. I think I tried it the other way around with this little daughter board lower and then putting that on top of it, it didn't work as well. Again, E for earth there's a common ground cable don't remember exactly I assume that's for more shielding on the far side of this so we had one two three four five six seven places with the screws in them I think the tips off it from this side there's a little black panel that comes off from around these and then you slide back the it comes out like that take this shielding off see it's got a coating on the other side and 
that's what that earth cable was connecting to. So at this point we've got access to the mixer board and the graphic EQ board for any cleaning. Got loads of videos about cleaning and could be using some sort of combination of contact cleaner, compressed air and uh, finishing off with a lubricant. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out my channel homepage. I've got several videos demonstrating cleaning in a lot of detail on other models but it's, it's going to be the same thing here. A lot of these caps are going to come off of these switches. For these types of switches I would say that it's easier to clean them with those caps off. Caps will come off these um, faders that it's not actually necessary to remove them I would say. Graphic EQ, this type of slider, I don't see it as often. It's really the same principle as one of these but with, without the metal casing on it. So you can um, clean it more easily if anything. Nothing else to remark on there I don't think. Very last thing we'll look at here is the door mechanism, it's broken on this one, like really there should be some sort of spring loaded mechanism that holds that up. It's missing on this, uh, I said earlier that this mounting post is broken off, I, I mean it was like that when I got it, I didn't do it. And there's some sort of melting and so on going on there, again not my doing, I think someone's made a botched attempt at repairing it. What it looks like to me is that there should be something on this that interacts with this spring but I think maybe that's broken off along with um, that mounting post. I take this spring out, you can see this fits on, there's a hole that corresponds to a mounting pin there so obviously this hinge is meant to sit like that and something is meant to push against there and that's meant to create the tension that keeps the door open when it's lifted by the user. I'm imagining I had another door. Sorry, I just had a fiddle with that off screen, but more or less at right angles to the case. And the allows you to put the door in and then push those together like that a little bit. And uh, when you do that, these little plastic protrusions fit into this hole here and the recess that I'm pointing to here. I think that's everything I can cover on this. I hope that's useful to somebody who is trying to take one of these apart.